Welcome everyone to the Astronomical Society of Edinburgh. Um, good to see you all. Um, we've got um, ASC members on Zoom with us and we have visitors from all around the world on, on YouTube. So you're very welcome uh, wherever you are. Uh, this is what we've got coming up tonight. Um, I have a, just a few slides, um, a few society updates, a few bits of interest and what we've got coming up next. Um, and then the main event of the evening is we're going to have a talk from Clara Brasser of the University of St Andrews about hearing the light astronomy data sonification. And I'm really looking forward to that. I always I think there's a strong link between astronomy and music, um, but I think maybe we'll see something a little bit different tonight or hear something different. Um, society is growing um, rapidly and we have our largest number of members ever and we're now at 191 um these are the ones who've joined in um, january louise gareth iva mike hillary and frank so i don't know if any of you're on but um can we unmute and welcome our new members So um, yeah, it's uh, um, it's amazing the number of members we've had recently. It's it's, it's um, really quite encouraging. Um, I don't know why that little um, I think I must have drawn on there. <laughs> um, to existing members, if you haven't um, renewed yet, um, it was due on the first of October. I know there are still a few of you who are outstanding, but not very many. So um, see Alan uh, um, at the next meeting, or um, there are easy ways of transferring your fee as well very good value lots of easy ways to stay in touch with us and uh, we have a website which has everything on it that, that we're doing lots of useful resources as well but all the upcoming events so if you want to know what we're we're doing that's that's the place to look we have facebook and twitter as well where we we post all of this stuff as well and if you're interested we have a really good back catalog of, of talks from the last few years on our youtube ch channel and this one will be on there afterwards as well um there really are some amazing talks on there quite quite a wide variety um a lot of them were during lockdown where we were doing two talks a week but um we now do two talks a month and they're all on there as well and if you want to see the images that some of our members are producing then um, go to our, our Flickr group um, there are loads of them on there and they are um, quite amazing what's being produced by members of the society you may have noticed as a as a, a relatively bright comet around at the moment that's the light curve of it and it's um about to peak in brightness probably um and that's um Comet C2022 E3 ZTF or ZTF as it's being called in, in many places, uh, but there are many <laughs> ZTF comets uh, and it's pretty bright and some of our members have been um, taking um, images of it. That's from um, Peter Black, and Bill Bonner, and you can start to see the, the, the two tails, the dust tail and the iron tail developing nicely. This one from Ramsey Mackayer and Pat Devine. And I think it's quite tricky to do comets because the comet's moving with respect to the stars. So what do you track? Do you track the stars or do you track the comet? Um, if you track the, the comet, you'll get trailing stars. If you track the stars, you get trailing comets. So it's, it's a bit tricky, but I think um, some really nice images here. Um, Ian Smith um, has done this one recently, and it's quite interesting because there's a, a disconnection event the, um, in the tail, which you can see here, where the, the solar wind is starting to um, disrupt um, the tail itself, and that it's in closer and um, multiple coronal mass ejections have uh, affected it as it's gone past the mass of the comet. So it's uh, it, it's rather interesting what's happening to it. Um, just for society members, our image of the quarter competition is up and running for January to March. Um, um, so send your um, pictures to me as as normal um, and these are the winners over the past year um, some some beautiful images and um, the winner of the year image of the year was um, Ramsey McIver with that one Coming up over the next few months um, on the 3rd of February we have um, Dr James Worcester telling us about computer simulations for modeling the formation of stars on their disks. Um, that will be in person at the Augustan United Church in Edinburgh on George IV Bridge, but also online on Zoom for ASC members and on YouTube for, for our visitors uh, wherever you happen to be. Um, 
for members only we have our imaging observing group on the 8th of february and that's online and it's a special one about amateur radio astronomy with paul hearn from the baa on the 17th of february emily levesque will tell us about the last stargazers about the the, the life of astronomers currently as astronomers and that will be online only on, on a zoom and youtube the 3rd of march the life of a planetary system from dr thomas wilson again that will be a hybrid one in person and online and if you want to know more about comets and you're an AAC member, then our Imaging and Observing Group in March uh, will have Nick James, the director of the Comet section of the British Astronomical Association, and he's, he's really very knowledgeable. So he'll tell us all about comets, how to observe them, image them, and, and gather data, and so on. The 17th of March, the Cherenkov Telescope Array from Dr. Roberta uh, Zanin, and that'll be an online only one. And um, on the 7th of April, it will be a members night only, and that's that's going to be in person and on Zoom for members, but it won't be on YouTube in this instance. And that will be short presentations by a number of AAC members, and we'll have the sky in April um, from Alan Pickup. That's really it from me. Um, I'm going to hand you over to Clara uh, from the University of St. Andrews, and she'll tell us about... Um, um, astronomy data sonification. So we're looking forward to that. So over to you, Clara. Thank you. Let me just get my screen shared. All right, can everyone see and hear me? Yep, that's great, thanks. Awesome. Um, so I am here today to talk about um, data sonification specifically of astronomy. Um, so before I dive into the talk itself, um, this is not work that I've done by myself. Um, as it said in, in the bio, I am a PhD student at the University of St. Andrew, Andrews currently. Um, but prior to this, I worked as a developer at the Space Telescope Science Institute. And so that's where I started this project um, with the three other people on this screen. There we go. So first of all, what, what is sonification? Well, what sonification is not is, whoa, um, data that is inherently sonic. So if you stick a microphone under the ocean and you record some whale sounds, or you record a lot of sounds and you want to distinguish what's happening, or if you're you know, figuring out what different types of uh, calls birds make, none of that is sonification because that data is inherently sonic to begin with. What sonification is, is representing data that is not inherently sonic with sound. So um, if you want to uh, talk about the temperatures across the United States or different kinds of animals that you're seeing um, and represent that as something that you can hear, that is data sonification. Um, it's sort of the oral equivalent of data visualization. So why would we want to do this? Um, there's a number of reasons. Um, the human ear in many ways uh, can uh, is a more precise instrument than the human eye. We can detect changes uh, at a much uh, faster temporal level. We can distinguish many, many frequencies. Uh, so there's a lot of potential uh, in our ear. Um, additionally, sonic data is multidimensional or sonic sound is mul inherently multidimensional in a way that our typical visualizations are not. Um, by and large, when we're looking at a visualization, we're looking at something that can be represented on a two-dimensional screen or sheet of paper. Um, so obviously that's very easy for two-dimensional plots. It's maybe not even terribly hard when we got want to get to three dimensions. We're all pretty good at perspective and seeing three dimensions um, represented in 2D. Um, but once you start getting more and more different parameters, it starts being hard to represent it on a single plot. And there's a lot of potential in the different, all the different aspects of sound that we can pick up and process. Um, 
And then, of course, there is the issue of accessibility. From my perspective, obviously, I'm, you know, new to the field relatively since I'm, you know, a second year undergraduate. And, you know, I think about, you know, if I had been born 10, 15 years earlier, I think I would have had a really hard time um, getting into astronomy at all. It would have been, there just wasn't the accessibility um, technology that I needed. And so every little step, things like this, like really matter to people like me. Um, it really makes things possible for me and people like me that w just wouldn't have been possible a couple decades ago. So to my mind, probably the most important reason um, to be really interested in figuring out uh, how to uh, uh, make Dana sonifications that are specifically useful for the purpose of analyzing data as opposed to um, you know, creating art pieces with data is this issue of accessibility to allow uh, people who find it difficult or impossible to engage with visual data to uh, become astronomers, to engage with astronomy at the level that um, those of us who are sighted have been able to do all along. Um, however, there are of course challenges and probably the biggest one um, is that creating sonifications is like creating visualizations. So it requires a lot of practice and effort both to create um, useful, usable, well-designed sonifications and to interpret them. Uh, creating and interpreting visualizations, plots, charts, these are part of our standard education starting at quite young ages um, down to you know lower primary school you're learning to make venn diagrams to make simple bar charts to to make plots and as you move forward in your education particularly if you go into a field that is more data intensive more science based uh, science or math based you spend a lot of time learning to create these visualizations and so we can't expect to turn around and be able to immediately and easily create and understand sonifications. And so it requires a certain amount of effort. Um, and that is hard to uh, make time for and needs to be supported. Um, just turning things into sound and saying go forth is not, is not um, enough. Also, no single tool can sonify everything well and different uses require different techniques. Um, the, the sonification that I'm going to be talking about in this lecture is primarily the kind of sonification that we do to enhance analysis as a equivalent to the sorts of plots and charts that would go in scientific papers that we, you know, as scientists create for ourselves um, when we're trying to understand data. But there are a lot of other use cases from teaching uh, children um, uh, the same way we teach children with visualizations to outreach efforts to, you know, the same way we have beautiful um, press images uh, from Hubble and other large telescopes and the ones that you, the amazing ones that you all do in your backyards with your telescopes. Um, the sonified equivalent of that is going to be very different and take different equipment and different tools. And there aren't, um, there are number of tools but they aren't widely known and they're generally not necessarily particularly easy to use and in general because there's so few blind and visually impaired astronomers they tend to be very specifically oriented towards a single researcher's project either the person who wrote the software or someone they collaborated with closely during their phd or postdoc or a particular research project so in this talk, I'm going to talk about the piece of sonification software that I'm involved with. I'm a principal developer for Astronify, um, which is specifically designed to sonify data from the TESS and Kepler Space Telescope missions. Um, the reason for that is that, as I said earlier, this is work, uh, this is a project that started uh, when I worked at the Space Telescope Science Institute, which houses the MAST archive, which among other missions archives the TESS and Kepler missions. So it started out as a looking at a tool to sonify our own data, but in a more general purpose way, not for a particular science use case. Um, the software is aimed at the professional astronomer or student. It is, you know, not meant to be particularly complicated or hard to use, um, but it is um, 
uh, was designed with the idea of what are what are the analysis pipelines that a uh, graduate student or professional astronomer will already be expected to use and how can this fit in there so that the user is not um, forced to you know move all of their data out of sort of the standard way that astronomers use it simply so they can use this tool. And so it's open source and freely available and written in Python. And the reason for that is because that's where um, a large portion of astronomy um, uh, programming happens these days. And we wanted it to sit there where that analysis happens. Um, so before I jump into what some, what some uh, what it sounds like to sonify astronomical data, let's start with some simple examples. Um, so this is a sonification tool that sonifies uh, time series data, so essentially line plots. So if we start just with a flat line and no change, this is what it sounds like. So I'm sure that's not entirely surprising. It's a single pitch. It persists throughout the um, plot. And before I go on, I also want to mention that I've I've uh, shown sonifications like this online before, and in my experience, the lag between the sound and the video is slightly different. So if you feel like the uh, moving cursor is a little bit off from what you hear, you're correct. Um, I don't know how to solve that problem, uh, so just be aware of it. Um, so moving on to something slightly more complicated, and we'll listen to a straight line. So it starts low, ends high, uh, grows in a very regular manner, also unsurprising. Going slightly more complicated, we've got the top of a triangle. So it goes up and then it comes down. And then here's where it maybe gets a little bit more interesting. So we've just heard that triangle and now we're going to hear the top of a circle. So this is also going to come up and come down, but the shape of it on the page is different. And you should be able to also hear this, that the way it rises, the rate at which it rises changes in a way that it didn't for the triangle. So that's some really simple data. There's no, you know, there's no jumping around, there's no error. Um, so let's uh, listen to some actual sonified astronomical data. Um, so uh, just a quick refresher, a light curve is a record of a star's brightness over time. So we're looking at um, how the same object changes its brightness as it moves through time. Um, so the Space Telescope missions Tess and Kepler, they produce light curves. Both of these missions were designed specifically to search for exoplanets, that's their main mission, but we can do a lot of, observe a lot of different astrophysical phenomena in the same data. Um, so light curves are typically visual, visualized as line graphs. Um, you have the light and you have time, and when it's higher, it's brighter, and when it's lower, it's dimmer, which we are going to translate into higher pitch and deeper pitch. Um, so here is an example of a little piece of a Kepler light curve. Um, so we can hear it changes over time and we all can also see on the plot how the line goes up and down. So starting with the basic um, reason for these satellites and exoplanets. So exoplanets, as I'm sure um, you know, are planets that orbit stars other than the sun. And there are many ways to detect exoplanets, but the method used by the TESS and Kepler satellites is the transit method. So this is where we point a telescope at the star and we um, look at the light over time and we hope to be able to see a small dip in the light uh, dimming from the star as the planet passes across the front of the star. And there are many different types of planets. We've found this way more and less Earth-like and more or less like things we see in the solar system. Um, and one of the interesting types of planets that we don't have in the solar system, but that we have discovered is really quite common, um, are hot Jupiters. So these are when Jupiter-sized planets, so very large planets, orbit extremely close to their host star. 
Um, Kepler 12b is one of these planets. Um, it has a period of just 4.5 days, so it's orbiting very close to the star, and it has really quite a deep transit because the planet is so big compared to its host star. Um, so now let's listen to this one. Um, so we can hear that there are these very clear dips where the pitch drops out as the planet transits in front of its star. Um, another type of star that uh, we can, another type of data that we can see in the Kepler data is a pulsating star. So a pulsating star is, is any star that expands or contracts on a regular period. And there's a lot of reasons that a star might do this. One of the common ones um, is stars that have are older than the sun that have evolved to the point where they've used up most of their fuel um, and they're older aged they are they become unstable as they have burned out most of their regular fuel they will uh, lose their ability to to hold themselves up and start collapsing and then as more matter is squished down they'll be able to um, start up uh, fusion again and it'll bounce them back out and so here's a star like that um, and we can listen to this one. So there's a very pronounced up and down and it's very regular and it just keeps going up and down and up and down. And that's, you know, over a long period of time, longer than we're ever going to stare at a star for one time. Um, this will change, but in the short period, we can just hear it going up and down, and we can tell things about the star based on how big the wobbles are and how far apart they are. Um, and so this is something that we can also hear quite clearly in this light curve. Um, a different kind of pulsating star is a pulsating binary. Um, so this is a binary uh, star system with an elliptical orbit. And so it's where um, uh, so because the orbits are elliptical, sometimes the stars are very close to each other and sometimes they're farther apart. And as they pass by, the stars exert a strong gravitational pull on each other, which deforms the stars and causes them to vibrate. And, and the way that they have this, these um, forces are exerted strongly when they're close and then slacks off when they're farther apart means that you get these vibrations set up in the star um, and then how wide those vibrations are also change over time. And so for this kind of system, you get a, oh, now it's, um, you get a light curve that looks like this. So you can see that there is a up and down going on as, as the star we're looking at pulses, but then also there's a sort of larger scale variation. Um, and this is what we're seeing. It's on the period of the rotation of the binary, the orbit of the binary, as the stars affect each other a lot and then a little and then a lot and a little. So if we listen to this now, So the rate at which I've sonified this is such that you can hear those large scale variations, the sort of wah wah, where it gets big and then small and then big and then small, but we can't really hear what's going on at a smaller scale. So if we want to do that, we can zoom in both on the plot and in terms of how we build a sonification. So I've slowed down just a small piece of this so we can hear what's really going on at the lower level. <laughs> Um, so that allows us to really, you know, drill down into what the smaller scale uh, variation in the stellar light curve is. Uh, so the last uh, astronomy phenomena I'm going to talk about in this data is my personal favorite, which is stellar flares. Um, so these are like solar flares. Um, and they're when a star releases a lot of energy in a surface explosion. And so you get a light curve that looks something like this. This is, of course, just a sketch, but you have um, a baseline starlight. Then there is a flare where it jumps up a huge amount as there's this explosion on the surface of the star that, um, you know, blasts out uh, gas and energy and light. And then it slowly uh, dims back to the baseline starlight. So on stars other than the sun, 
um, the one the flares that we observe are much larger than the flares we observe on the sun, not so much because they don't have small flares, but because they're so far away that we can't see them. Um, however, in general, our sun does not flare as does not have as energetic flares as the ones we see on other stars, which is really quite excellent for us as earthlings because the flares um, can have uh, lots of effects on uh, flares can have effects on our GPS on on various um, things on Earth, but because our sun is relatively quiet we're pretty okay. Um, so here is, this is a light curve that is actually not from Kepler or TESS. It's from the Gallup Space Telescope, which was an ultraviolet space telescope. So um, a little bit higher, a little shorter wavelength, um, and it orbited the Earth. And this is a nearby star that had this really beautiful flare in, I think, like 2009. Um, so this, uh, so for this one, you can hear that there is some activity going on in the, um, light curve, uh, you know, there's some, some variation, but it's not very big. And then you can hear it as it just spikes up and then travels down, um, and that it hasn't quite reached back to its base, um, its base light level. Uh, here's another light curve where there's more going on in the star itself. Um, probably there are some star spots on the star, so dark patches on the star that create variation in the light that comes from it as it uh, rotates. And in, in addition to that, there is some flaring activity. So uh, if we listen to this, we'll see what we can hear. So we can hear that there's a lot more going on in terms of baseline variability, um, and we can sort of hear this pulsing that is that variability that's on the orbit of the star. And then additionally, we can hear these higher pitches that are the flares. And one of the things that I think is interesting is both when I listen to this light curve and when I look at the light curve, there are some flares that are very clear because they're very high. It's very um, different. And then there are some that are, you know, is it just um, is it just an outlier that is maybe um some noise or is it really there and um i just think it's it's interesting because in some ways um uh i feel like you think okay well maybe maybe if i listen to it i will I'll be it'll be so much more clear or maybe it's not clear because i'm just listening but really some of the problems of data um, you know, that there is noise, that there's other things going on than whatever the astrophysical phenomena we care about. Those those are just there. They're in the data and we can't um, just make them go away by by how we choose to visualize or sonify our data. Um, all right. So now I'm going to go ahead and make it interactive. Um, so we're going to listen to some sonifications and I'm going to ask some questions. Shout your answer at the screen. Um, or write it in the chat on Zoom or YouTube. Um, I won't really have access to that, but really try to think about it. Um, so we're going to start with exoplanets. Um, exoplanets are great. Um, exoplanets um, are planets that orbit other stars, and we're looking for transits when the planet passes in front of its host star and blocks some of the light. So here's a very um, clear example transit. Um, it starts high pitched, it deepens, and then it comes back to its original pitch. So that's all very lovely, but in the real world, we don't get data that that's, lov that's that lovely most of the time. So I'm gonna play several sonifications. Um, and after East one, I will ask how many times you heard the exoplanet transit. All right, so here we go. Five. 
five. Five. Five. Five. Okay. Five. Mm -hmm. Hearing a lot of fives. Uh, come on. There we go. You are all correct. There's five. So let's listen to it again now while we're looking at the bot. Yeah, so that wasn't so hard. Let's try another one. This time, how many transits do you count? Nineteen. Yeah. Nineteen. Nineteen. Well, I nineteen or eighteen. Yeah, think. yeah. This one. This one. There's a lot. Nineteen. Mm -hmm. You're very good. Mm -hmm. You can listen to it again. All right, so here's another one, and this one also has a little extra thing in it, if you can listen for it. Three. Three, Three transits Three. and some sort of vibration wobble around. Yeah. yeah, so there's more going on in this one. Yeah, if we look at it, yeah, there's... There's um, some some variation in the star that's that's separate from the transit, and then there's actually a little spike at the end that might be a little flare or might just be a little outlier. So let's listen for all of that. All right. So here is the last one this one is going to be significantly more challenging because there's a lot going on in the star um so listen for the transits anyone hear anything three three three, three yeah Four. all right So there were three transits, but there's also this huge amount of variation going on in the star that is just much bigger. The, the transit is so small comparatively. So let's listen again. So the transits are just tiny little blips in the face of all of that variation. That could have been four instead of three, though. Depends where I worked on the wave you count. Yeah, well, and all of these, all of these transits that I've played, all of these uh, light curves that I've played, are um, we're only talking about single planets. It gets much more complicated in systems that might have multiple planets. Um, you know, and when when you hear transits of different depths, is it are they all the same transit? What is the period of the planet? It can get quite complicated. All right, so now we're going to move on to flares. Um, so flares, again, are releases of a huge amount of light of energy and an explosion on the surface of a star. Um, so a very perfect example flare. Um, so this is very idealized. You can hear the rise and you can hear it drop off. Um, but when they're shorter, often you can just only hear that hear that as a that rise. Um, so in this case, what we're going what I'm going to do is play some sonifications. And the question is, did you hear a stellar flare? Unlike transit, stellar flares um, aren't you know repeated or regular. They happen when the right conditions 
um, build up on the surface of a star, and so we can't predict them, which means that they can be quite hard to study because you can't really point, unless you have a star that flares a lot, you can't really point your telescope at it and just say, all right, flare now, um, which means that um, missions like T Tess and Kepler that are observing stars for long periods of time to look for planets are also ideal for looking for flares because they're staring at the same star for a lot of time. So we get to see when it has these sun and unexpected brightenings. Um, so here is the first light curve. Flare, yes or no? Yes. 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 Yep. Yep. So there's other things happening in the light curve a bit, but there is one large flare. All right, here is the next one. Flare? Yes. Maybe. Yes, maybe. <laughs> Anyone for no? No. No. All the answers. Very All small. right. Hmm? A very small one. So, it's no. Too very small. There's some greater variation, some, some, uh, uh, some peaks but nothing is really the shape of the flare and nothing really stands out that much yeah. um compared so here we can listen again no flare no <laughs> all right next sonification Flare? Right. No flare? Right. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Haven't yep. Clue. There was definitely a flare. But was did you hear anything different about this one? There was a different sound, but I heard it three times. So I assumed it was Right. Yeah. Right. So that's it. There was more than one flare. So let's listen to this one again, and this time we're going to try to count how many flares. How many flares? Three. Five. Five. Five Three, seven. five, seven. seven. <laughs> All right, let's listen one more time and then I'll show you the answer. Anyone want to change their answer? Five. Nope. All right. Yeah. So there's actually seven, but some of them are quite small. Yeah. So let's listen again. So the last two are quite hard to hear, and the fourth and fifth one are very close together. Um, and here is where I can also tell you that part of the re reason that there are so many flares in this light curve, and part of the reason that I'm absolutely sure that even that very small one is a flare, 
is that this is a light curve that I added flares to because I was working on a project where I needed to determine whether or not what what energy I could detect flares at. And the way to do that is to create a bunch of them, put them in the light curve, and then see if you can find them. And so that also allowed me to create uh, sonifications like this, where I can say, I absolutely know that there are seven flares here because I put them in. <laughs> and um, yeah, the uh, some turns out it's harder to get flares out than it is to put them in. All right, so if you had fun with that, that was um, on our website, which is astronify.readthedocs.io. Um, what we just did was this um, level one flares and transits, um, but you can um, go deeper into exoplanets and and look at different ways of, of, uh, do, of analyzing exoplanet data. Um, so feel free to give that a look. Um, additionally, I want to, you know, I've talked a lot about this particular piece of software um, that I was involved in building, but there is a huge world of sonification, both specifically for astronomy, astronomy specifically for astronomy and physics, and just in general. Um, so there's this website, sonification.design, um, where uh, some people involved in um, the sonification world are trying to collect um, all of the projects around sonification. And for this slide, I just put in physics and astronomy and there's way more than what I'm showing here. And then there's also things for geology and, and geography and um, uh, medicine. And so there's a huge amount of projects and there's a lot of projects um, everything from sort of one-offs where, where someone worked really hard to sonify a particularly beautiful image, or there's a couple of really excellent um, sonifications of various aspects of COVID data, um, because I guess if you're interested in sonification and you um, are having a lockdown, this is what you do. Um, but there is also other programs like ours where you can put in your own data and you can play around with it. And um, there are projects aimed at children. There are projects aimed at sonifying images. I've talked a lot about how we sonify light curves, but images are a whole different thing, um, different different kinds of data. So I highly encourage you to poke around on here. It's, I mean, I've only looked at a fraction of it and it's just incredibly interesting and exciting. Um, and then again, I encourage you to check out our website. Um, it is written in Python, so if anyone codes, check it out, try your own data. Um, but also on that website, we have links to a number of sonifications in addition to the ones I've showed you here, sonifications of various astrophysical phenomena along with little explanations of what they are. Um, so there's also just a cool sort of gallery of sonifications to check out. Um, yeah, so that's my talk, and I am happy to answer any questions. Well, thank you for that, Clara. That was, I think, um, unique in in the talks you've had, and the quiz was very creative. So, can we thank Clara first, and then we want to some questions? Okay, uh, as always, if you want to put your questions in the chat, um, either on Zoom or in YouTube, and we'll we'll ask them if we've got time. Um, Peter, if you want to. Um, see where we are with, with questions just now maybe people haven't caught up yet i'm not sure okay. yeah well the the the, the 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 chat got flooded with all the answers to the <laughs> that is a risk uh I'm, I'm not spotting any specific questions at the moment i, yeah, I can okay. ask a couple from youtube if you want to start yeah okay carry on okay. yeah it was an excellent talk, really enjoyable, and everybody's enjoying. There are lots of answers from the quiz as well, shot on YouTube. <laughs> so interactive from all over the world. Fantastic. So first question is from Giorgio uh, Ponte. What is the sort of most strange sound in astronomy that, um, that sort of makes you th sort of think of, um, of many questions to answer? That's a really interesting question. Um, yeah, so I would say that one of the things that, because I'm specifically looking at um, making sonifications for people who want to analyze data, one of the things that I struggle with and has caused me to make some really weird and 
very interesting but mostly unhelpful sounds is trying to come up with a way to express the error, the uncertainty, because this is important for understanding how we analyze data is, is what is the uncertainty with our data points. So when we make inferences based on them, how how confident in them can we be? And this is something we do on plots typically with error bars, right? You put a point and then you put a range and that indicates where you think it is. Um, and I have to say that attempting to do that with sound has led to some really interesting results. Um, yeah. <laughs> No, that's that's it's a, it's, a, it's a difficult one, I suppose, when you compare when you transfer everything to sound. And um, moving on, um, there's someone called Tim Mann who's who's asked about this, which is kind of what you you, you sort of marked on there. How do you sort of uh, um, do you look for a specific range for detection or just a large change? How do you di differentiate usable data noise from um, unusable data noise? If you see what I mean. I yes, that's so kind this of what you're is, branching on there. Yeah, and, and I think that this is an interesting question because there are some ways to do it that involve um, sort of uh, the extra data or that comes with the data, like the metadata data about the data. So when you get data from the Kepler mission, there's an in addition to just the, you know, the timestamp and the brightness value, there's a number of other data values. And one of them is they have what they call a data quality flag. So that's something to look at. And that, like, I haven't sonified that there. And frankly, when I use that data, I don't put that on my visualizations. But it is something to always look at. But another thing is to consider what you know about the phenomena. So for flares, um, what I end up with a lot of the time are things that I classify as might be a flare, might not be a flare because it's there are a lot of short flares it's really normal but at the same time if a flare is short enough that it only affects one data point it's like how do i distinguish that between how do i distinguish between well that was a short flare so it is just one data point that's increased and well you know something something happened to the data it was a it was a hot pixel or something and there's a couple of ways like you so say you can look at the data flags um you can look at like did all the other stars around that star flare at the same time if so it's not going to be real they're not going to flare at the same time um so it's a, it's actually a really complicated um problem when when you get to um when you get down to things that are sort of on the edge that are that are near your detection limit that are you know only a couple of points um yeah it becomes a matter of looking what's around it looking looking for you have to basically look for sort of any instrumental reasons not to believe the data and then if there aren't any you probably believe the data but with like a certain amount of uncertainty if that makes sense absolutely no that's excellent thank you and the final one from youtube from Martin Pride, how do you deal with sounds that would naturally fall outside the human hearing range? Do you adjust the sound or ignore it? Ah, yes. Well, so in this case, I think that this is this is something that I've thought about, and this is it's mostly irrelevant to the data that I've been presenting here because it's not sound to begin with. So when I translate it from brightness into sound, one of the first things that I do is you know, specify that the lowest data point is going to be, you know, some hertz that's within the human hearing range and the highest data point will be another hertz. And what I actually discovered is that what's more critical than the human hearing range is the range that your computer speaker will play, because it turns out that that's smaller. Um, but when you're thinking about things that produce like essentially sound, right, that produce waves at a certain wavelength, you can you can think of that as sound, but they're often out of the human hearing range. And so, yeah, if you want to analyze it as sonification, you have to move it into the human hearing range. And then it becomes a question of how do you do that in a way that, you know, keeps the, keeps the characteristics of the data so that you can properly, you know, understand it. Um, uh, yeah, and, and also I think this is where we get into the question of why are we sonifying it, right? Like I've heard really excellent sonifications of say massive stars where they're sonifying the winds. And so 
they are taking you know these winds that are vibrating at you know something that could not be heard by the human ear and it's in space anyway um and turning it into something we hear but they want to keep that sort of feeling of like rushing wind and like um you know a very big star and so there's some artistic elements to as well because you want to convey the feeling of that but you do also want to have it be a real sonification where you're not just sort of you know making a piece of art off the idea which is also a great thing to do but is not the same thing marvelous thank you we've got some uh some zoom questions now nigel would you like to kick off nigel i think you might be muted or your cat's muted you nigel would you like to kick off Yes, I'll, I'll do that, Peter. Thank you very much, Clara, for an uh, absolutely fascinating uh, talk. Oh, hang on. You might be muted, or your cat's muted. No. no, I should. Oh, sound there. Hang on. Hold on a second. We can hear you. It's okay. Yes, I'll, I'll do that, Peter. Thank you very much, Clara, <laughs> for an absolutely fascinating uh, talk. If, if you want to mute again, Nigel, I'll read your question. Now. That's okay. On you go, Peter. On you, I think you should okay. go. Okay. Nigel's question <laughs> is, are there any discoveries made that could only have been made through sonification? Great question. Oh, man. I would so, so love to tell you that the answer is yes. <laughs> but honestly, it's not. Um, <laughs> um, so we have, um, our group in specific has been working with the test science team um to add sonification or to work on a sonification component of their plant discovery pipeline um but i mean at this point we're still in the beginning stages of figuring out how um as a community um not just our project um but the wire sonification community how to um assess sonifications and so sort of without that it's very hard to um use them alone Thank you. <laughs> okay. Frank, Frank, you're next on the list. Okay, thank you. Um, once again, can I echo my thanks for your talk, Clara? It was um, fascinating, to say the least. And my question is, um, is there any correlation between the projects that you're working on and the projects that other people are working on that you may not know, for instance, um, about the sounds that come out of a particular set of data? So whenever we use the word Clara, everybody understands what that means. And the, the sounds themselves are um, transportable from person to person in that way. Um, so I'm asking you, are the sounds that, or the sonics that you produce, are they transportable? And therefore, is this an embryonic language? Oh, interesting. Um, so yeah, there are definitely, so I was, um, participated in a sonification workshop in, in December. And one of the things that was interesting was that there are, um, commonalities. There are sort of decisions that get made early on. And then once they're made, you often the sonifications are similar. So our sonification, it's like, do you focus on, um, a time series, whether that's spectra or light curves or images. And that's one clear break um, because you're dealing with 1D or 2D data. And then there is the, do you decide to go down the like trying to use musical instruments or just trying to map to pitches? And once you make those breaks, you find that there are definitely commonalities um, in the way sonifications sound, but there aren't a lot of, um, I would say that using your analogy, I don't think there is enough of a shared vocabulary um, yet. Each project is still making a lot of the decisions um, completely uniquely, which is, or not uniquely, um, but in a vacuum, like on their own, doing their best. And then this is, I think, one of the reasons that um, collaboration and and uh, talking to each other is very important um, because uh, a set of norms, I don't know whether 
it could be called a language, but like a set of norms around how to do this is something that can make it easier to then understand future sonifications. Like there are so many conventions about how you read a plot. We need something like that in sonification and it does not yet exist. Thank you. Very good. Graham, do you want to ask you a question? Yeah, um, I, I think you've sort of answered part of it, which was about how you calibrate your loudspeakers because the speakers I've got here, clearly are not capable of giving the same amount of power at, um, at certain at different frequencies. But also, my ears don't pick them up differently. But on the other hand, neither do my eyes. I've got one eye that sees one set of colors, one eye that sees another. Um, how, do you, um, how do you standardize that? Or is there no form of standardization? You can't just say, here's a particular um, sort of, uh, number of dare I say, old-fashioned terms, angstroms for a, a wavelength, uh, you, you don't have the same for sound and for the volume of sound. Right, yes. And so this is, I think, why one of the most, like, uh, it's um, why typically, right, you start with, okay, we've got time and we've got pitch, because pitch is... I mean, modulo the fact that our ears don't linearly respond to pitch, which is definitely something to think about. We're very used to this idea of like discerning lower pitch versus higher pitch. And, you know, once you've got a range that your speakers, uh, your computer or whatever you're listening to speakers can produce, they will produce the right pitch. Whereas for volume, yes, that is like, um, and in general, one of the one of I would say the the challenges that I have found from a programming perspective is that dealing with directly dealing with the sound capabilities of the computer is much more fragile computer to computer. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think that in some ways, uh, there's like analogies where like, you know, people are colorblind, so you can't depend on them, everyone seeing color the same way when you make plots and different, you know, maybe they print it in black and white, or, you know, you've got a, a night vision redner on your computer. But at the same time, like, yes, there are, I think, a lot of the ways in which are um, the combination of the technology and the difference in, in speaker quality and the way our ears pick up is something that, that and this is what comes into the needing to have better ways of assessing sonifications because we can't just make those issues go away. So we need sonifications that are successful across across sort of, you know, a broad range of hearing abilities and and types of speakers, right? Like it's even if we can get the perfect sonification, if you can only use it if you you know, are someone who has perfect hearing on a high quality hi-fi system that's not actually useful as a general purpose tool. And that's something that I think we struggle with assessing now because the sort of the way we do things now is like, oh, look, I made a thing here, you listen to it, you know? Um, and also how do we distinguish between what is is training? Like I am way better listening to these sonifications than I was when I started and I've noticed you know, over sharing them with, a, with you know, a broad range of people that like, by and large, people who are blind or vision impaired, and so are more used to taking in large amounts of data orally, are better at understanding the sonifications faster, you know, and so we also have to account for that in terms of figuring out how people hear things. And it's, it's, it's a challenge. And I, yeah, I don't have a good answer, but it's definitely a, a challenge. Thank you. Well, I, uh, Kenneth, do you want to ask your questions? I don't see you on the screen. Are you there? Uh, yes, I'm here. Clara, uh, uh, interesting, uh, fascinating discussion. I just wonder what the general history was of sonification in astronomy. I mean, how far back does it go? Who were the first guys to do this? Or gals, by the way? <laughs> yeah, um, that's a good question. Because I, I remember, I remember one of the first uh, pulsars being sonified. You know, a very rapid blipping sound. Yeah, I just wanted, uh, that was probably good 40 years ago. Yeah, yeah, I'm not, I'm afraid I don't really know much of the history. There certainly um, has been an increasing interest in it over the last couple of years, but that's obviously, it started long before that. Yeah. 
Yeah, solid. Okay, uh, Ria had a comment that she might want to mention. Ria, are you there? Yes, hi. Thank you for the talk, it was amazing. Um, I love the exercises, so I'm definitely going to check out the website. Um, so I was just saying that sonifying all the space debris um, orbiting in low Earth orbit could be interesting because it's very busy. And uh, well, not just space debris, obviously satellites as well. And that might help people in understanding how much stuff is up there and um, how congested these orbits are. Yeah, that's an excellent idea. I kind of want to go try that now. <laughs> okay. Uh, and Mr. Mackey, you have a question? You, everyone. Uh, excellent talk. It's very close to my heart because... Um, as a poorly sighted person, I listen a lot. I listen to television. It's not worth going to watch it. Um, I can just listen to it. Um, is there any application for this in relation to being able to hear things that you can't see? And with practice, as you described, you could you could get to understand what the pitches are the same way that you get different pitches on a numeric keyboard, for example, or on a telephone, say. Um, and I think we had some presentation of this some long time back, but not at all in your topic. It was more to do with the observer than understanding the data. Um, but I wonder if you've thought of that at all. Um, I'm not sure I understand exa exactly what you mean. You mean um, sort of entirely taking out the visual element? I mean, using visual presentation of something that other people could see so you would know what was there by listening to the sound of it. Yes, yes, yes. I mean, I think that that is, is very much a goal. It's one of those sort of interesting things where as, as the developer, I sort of spend a lot of time comparing uh, plots and comparing the sound because I'm trying to, you know, build it. And, and then as a sighted person who's used to plots, I just, it becomes very, um, it's interesting to think about how hard I've, I've been, find, I find it to get out of the rut of always depending on, um, on visualizations. And that's why, so um, Sarah Kane, who was in the little video I showed at the beginning, um, she is now a final year um, undergraduate student and will be starting her PhD next year and has, I think basically no sight. And so she was probably the first person I knew who used Astronify completely without, you know, using uh, visualization. And it's been very interesting talking to her and realizing, um, you know, the treating to, to, to make that switch into treating the sound as the main main thing with no visualization or a visualization as an afterthought instead of the other way around. Um, and one of, I think, some of one of the um, things that needs to be added to Astronomify before it can really truly, um, I mean, you can use it with a screen reader and it'll tell you all the information, but we don't have any equivalent of, um, of like um, axes that tells you um, what the scale is. Uh, you you can get that out of the data, but it doesn't come packaged with the sonification. So that's something I've been thinking from that from that side of things. Okay, that, that's all fantastic. I think we have to sort of uh, wrap it up at that point and hand back to our president. Well, thank you very much, Clara. I mean, I, I think you've really captured everyone's imagination. There are there are there are loads more questions that we could go on all night but i think we should probably let you let you let you go there but thank you very much for that and can we can we thank clara again for that amazing talk really good. yeah and thanks so much for having me um it's been great speaking to you no, and thanks uh, for all the uh, wonderful uh, questions uh, really good really good R really yeah. captured the imagination it really has um there are, there are loads more questions that we could go on all night but... <laughs> sorry right um that's it for tonight our next um Meeting is on the 3rd of February. That's in Newcastle United Church in Edinburgh. If you want to join us on computer simulations, monitoring the formation of stars and their disks, and it will be on Zoom and on YouTube again for all our, our, our guests, as always. So thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Clara, and I'll see you again soon. Good night. Good night.